Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. This is Rachel Caruso here. You are a facilitator into integrative shamanism. Today, I didn't much feel like being on camera. Nonetheless, I've had important messages that I've been wanting to share with you all. So I wanted to carry on making videos. So you'll just have my voice today. And actually I'm addressing the topic which I posted about on YouTube. As I mentioned, I had made a video that I wanted to publish, but the editing software has just been going berserk. And so I haven't been able to make the necessary edits to the video to upload it. So I'm just going to discuss that subject with you today with just audio, which is just as good. Except you can't see when I'm smiling. <laughs> well, anyways, let's just get right into it. A few weeks ago, I believe it was the 10th of July, I was viciously publicly attacked by the Illuminati. And what was most concerning with this was the response of bystanders. So the attack was actually a physical violence and it was instigated by a man who actually has a bad reputation in town. People call him Psycho James, James being his first name. Now he's actually has proclaimed himself as a satanic Illuminati bloodliner to me in public at the same location where he attacked me. However, it was a previous occasion in which he confessed to being a satanic Illuminati member. So on this occasion, it was senseless violence that he had instigated and he was trying to start a brawl or a pack fight and entrap me in it. So he was actually trying to insert me in a pack fight of about four or so men, drunken men, and very angry men. Why else would, why else would people be fighting in a brawl like that? They've got a lot of anger. And, you know, this behavior is really to be expected of narcissistic, sociopathic, or psychopathic satanic Illuminati members. But as I said, what was most concerning is actually the behavior of the witnesses and bystanders. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. We are starting to awaken to the fact that we live in a satanic world. And that's not to say that God isn't present here, but it's to say that we've actually allowed satanic forces to rule and govern our planet and our very own consciousness. Now, if you want a better world, that actually requires that each and every one of us does something about it. Each and every one of us makes extraordinary strides to embody and propagate our hard-won values. And by hard-won, I mean we have to decide for ourselves what is right, what is wrong, what is helpful, what isn't, what is true love and what isn't, and why. And we also have to decide who we are as a personal and unique soul and human. And together, this makes up our personal values. Having values that have been carefully created and living by them, doing everything you can to put them into the world. That is what makes good character. And this is required to actually bring change to the world. We have to stand up for ourselves and become leaders of ourselves, be sovereign beings. And so in being leaders of ourselves, we are no longer followers or slaves to any kind of force, such as the satanic force that has overtaken our planet. And unfortunately, we are largely guilty of enabling evil and abuse. And abuse is an expression of evil. So let's get that clear. They're not separate. And it is necessary to be able to see and define our reality so that we can properly navigate it. 
So it is necessary to be able to identify, identify evil, abuse, and what's, what's particularly helpful is identifying the patterns of narcissism. Narcissism is actually evil embodied. But there's another component to evil, which is laziness. And this is something that even people who aren't, who aren't narcissists are prone to. So this laziness is what actually enables and endorses evil and abuse and narcissism. So enablers of evil are actually secondary perpetrators. So they're not the primary perpetrator, but they are the secondary perpetrator. And sometimes people end up just perpetrating upon themselves, enabling abuse for themselves, and they're less inclined to enable it for others. And those kinds of people are the ones who have a really strong North Star, but they have very low self-worth. Yet there are plenty, and I would say more often than not, enablers, the secondary perpetrators, do enable this abuse and evil upon other people. And that's what happened with me whenever I was attacked on the 10th of July. It was a good variety of people who enabled and endorsed abuse, who actually vilified me and defended my attacker, <laughs> even given the fact that this man's reputation well precedes him. He's even given the name Psycho James, and his, his behavior speaks for him. So if you're local in the UK, this man is a longtime resident of the Totnes and Dartington area. So his family is also from here. So I'd just like to make this a little bit more real for you and bring it closer to home if you are from the area and you know who I'm talking about. And in addition to enabling and endorsing abuse and reversing the targets and perpetrator roles, another dynamic that was present was the oppression of the strong or fierce feminine. So just to put it in a nutshell, essentially what happened was James deliberately tried to instigate a brawl in which I was physically trapped and he did this in a very calculated way and strategic way. So it actually took a few minutes for him to entrap a group of people into brawling with him. And while all of this was happening, you know, it was loud, um, there was verbal abuse, and there were other witnesses. And none of them did a damn thing, even though there were three females mixed up in this, one of them being myself. So it was four drunken, angry, antagonized men that would have potentially been in this drunken brawl. Now, the two females, as, as they were physically positioned, were actually free to break away. They were free um, so that they wouldn't necessarily be physically harmed. I, however, was already cornered in. And as I said, nobody who just stood by and gawked like they were at a zoo did a damn thing, including a couple who I actually knew, who I had even seen earlier that day and had a conversation with them who are of the spiritual community where they strive supposedly to live their best light. Now we'll get to the toxicity in that in just a moment, but the evidence of it is in their apathy, their indifference, and their complicitness to this violence. So as this situation was ramping up, because James, as I said, was strategic, strategically 
antagonizing and calculating everything to try to close in on me. And I'll explain a little bit more of the uh, logistics of how this all happened, but essentially I was cornered in with a group of violent drunken men. And after a couple minutes, I did try to, well, during that time, during the whole time from start to finish, I was trying to diffuse the situation, focusing on the group of men who James was trying to entrap. So he entrapped them basically by threatening them. These were random passerbys, strangers who he didn't know. Um, so he started screaming at them, threatening them like with horrific disgusting violence, threatening to rape and kill and maim their mothers. Also threatening to kill them, saying things like, oh, I can kill you with one finger. And what is he talking about there? He's talking about his black magic. And the group of men were, the. it was about three men with two women and they were all young. So about 18 to 20, maybe 21. And as I said, they were intoxicated. And at that age, there's also more hormones, which naturally make a person a little more unstable or prone to impulse. Brain development has a factor in that as well. So because I knew James was doing this on purpose and the bystanders or that group of people were innocent, I put my focus on them first to try to diffuse the situation. First, I made a joke. I tried to bring in some humor so that they would laugh it off and walk away. Now they were passing James and James turned around to pursue them with these insults, with these verbal assaults and threats. So he was stalking and harassing them, which made it all the more difficult for this group of people to ignore him. And so I kind of helped for a moment to distract this group of people and just encourage them to forget about him. You know, he's not worth it. He's, he's not even all, all there in the mind. But James had pursued them and they had passed me, like the whole group of them together had passed me. And so, you know, I wasn't at the point where I could engage with them. Now, where I was physically positioned was at a picnic table off, right off the path, um, right off a walking path by the river. So if you're local, it's the walking path that goes from Dartington to Totnes. And it's near the, uh, the swinging ropes where most people like to swim at the river, closer to Totnes. Now, I actually set up spiritual services there. So I turn this into my booth on occasions. And that's why I was there. So this table is right off a path, which is about six or so feet wide, seven feet wide. And there's just woods, so trees and brushes right behind the picnic table. And so there's nowhere to go if you're cornered in like I was from James and this group of people. And like I said, I'll get to the more details about how he strategically brought them back to corner me in, but I really want to first touch on the reaction of the bystanders and the witnesses because it was just mind boggling. And the more time and space I got from the incident, the more fucked up and dysfunctional I realized it was. And also how important the subject is to address with people in the spiritual community who actually do want to put good into the world, but who are failing because they've not developed their character or their courage. It does require courage to live your values. But more than courage, I would say it actually requires a, a divine righteousness a force within you that says you'll stand up for truth and for what's right just because it needs to be done just because nothing else is acceptable and when you're in that space courage really isn't a factor because there's no there's no fear that you have to move through 
and there's no consequences that you're worried about. It's just about doing what's right because it's what's right. So after, you know, I was unable to defuse the situation and James brought this group of people back to my picnic table and then positioned them all and himself so that I couldn't even come out the one side of the picnic table. It was the only side that was open to an exit. And I noticed that the bystanders were just gawking. I realized I had to, I was going to be the one who did something about this or I would likely die because they were very close to fighting. Um, the group of young men, they were getting violent, um, hitting, hitting doors and hitting walls nearby and started to approach James with that violence running through them, that violent energy running through them. And, you know, put it all into, just look at all the components of this. I'm a petite female. I have a lot of long time physical injuries from my MK Ultra torture. And you have four men who are drunk and volatile. One who is deliberately trying to cause me harm. And why I can discern that, again, I'll go into once we get into the details of, of his strategy, of James's strategy. So I was blocked in, about to be in the middle of this brawl, being the target of all of this violence. If I didn't stop it, if the brawl started, I would have died. So seeing this, I was like, okay, this is time, this is the time to channel something bigger than me and also to channel my personal power. Now, thankfully, when I'm in, when I'm in like my work mode, so I had come, I'd set up at the booth to offer my spiritual services. And that's what I was doing that day. When a healer steps in to, steps up to the plate for their work, it's like their psychic abilities and their healing abilities just open a lot wider. And so this is the case with me every time I go to that booth. My psychic senses um, and my channels for light are just like blown wide open. So I am thankful I was already in this uh, mental and energetic space where I could sense and communicate with God very clearly, communicating with spirit very clearly. And I'm also not a stranger to dealing with usually more or rather less violent Illuminati attacks here. So I, I'm always guided in how to deal with negativity here. It's never had, it's never been at that level where my life is in imminent danger. But it is that, that divine connection that I was consciously in that said, stand up for yourself. You're the one in charge here, step up to the plate and take charge of the situation regardless of what it looks like, you know, four or so men uh, threatening your physical safety. So again, I first focused on um, all my, you know, actions were guided, although I could say that I wasn't really sure how it was going to play out. It was just, you got to take these things step by step. So the first thing I did was address the group of, of men who were being harassed. And I said, he's he's not worth it i got i got loud and i got firm right so i started to channel this strength and this authority and that was the key thing and i told them you you all keep going on your path and then i turned to james and i said and you go the other way and something very key when dealing with narcissists people who won't listen to you when you need to be listened to I mean, everyone has the right to be listened to. Um, and it's narcissists who specifically, habitually, pathologically don't listen. So a key technique to use in those instances is to repeat yourself just the same words over and over at a steady pace or a steady rhythm and it will eventually force them to acknowledge something else other than 
what they're trying to carry on with. So sometimes they'll acknowledge your words. Sometimes it'll just kind of cause like a break in their psyche and they'll like kind of fall apart. And then they are no longer in control of the situation and you are. And so I repeated this over and over to the group of men. I said, go this way, go on your way. And I said to James, go this way. You And just repeated it about five times at least, maybe more, because they weren't responding to it. They weren't listening. They were still trying to get at each other to fight. And I also stood up from my booth. I mean, you can probably imagine I wasn't, I wasn't facing this sitting down, but I approached James. So I brought myself squarely face to face with James instead of backing away in fear. So it's important to show anybody who's attacking you or trying to take your power away that you aren't afraid they rely on your fear to make you their victim and typically i probably would have been afraid but like i said it was that psychic openness that told me commands the situation and don't even give a second thought to fear so when nobody was listening I tried another tactic. I wanted to get the attention of other people. Now, not because I expected them to do anything, because already they were aware of this ruckus, they were aware of this violent situation, and there were at least three people around um, just standing there watching. But drawing more attention to the situation actually deters the perpetrator. These people are cowards. They don't want public attention on what they're doing, or they want to be able to try to pass off what they're doing as something else, like they're not actually doing anything. <laughs> they're not the ones at fault. Like, yeah, maybe there's a ruckus, but they're going to try to uh, just keep everything obscure or pass everything off onto you, make you the perpetrator. So I'm being guided to share this right now. This is a specific lesson I've learned recently in, in uh, several occasions. I was actually recently uh, kidnapped by a bus driver. You can read about that on my No Witness Facebook page, which is linked in the description box below. But this may come in handy for any one of you listening, whether you're a TI or not. If you are in a vulnerable state, if somebody is trying to victimize you, draw attention to what they are doing. And so you wanna make it public, but you also wanna make it clear what they're doing. So rather than just screaming help or stop, identify to everyone else within earshot what is happening. And like I said, a lot of times, unfortunately, the bystander effect takes precedence and people are apathetic and they do nothing, but this will deter your assailants. So at this point in the attack, I started um, yelling and in a strong voice. So not like, um, you know, not a high pitched voice, but in a strong lower voice, an authoritative voice. I said, there will be no violence here. And I kept repeating that about 10 times. There will be no violence here. And I was yelling it, nobody was listening. So I moved on to another phrase or another statement to really identify that there is something wrong to anybody with an earshot because there were houses that lined the one side of the path and they actually sit on a hill overlooking the path. They're separated off, like they're protected by a fence, but they're overlooking and everybody could be standing at their windows watching and listening. And so I then started to repeat, step away from my belongings. So I had my spiritual booth set up there, right? I give crystal readings. 
if you don't know what that is, it's because um, I invented it. <laughs> um, I won't go into what it is, but yeah, it, I'm using crystals and I do readings. So I have a whole setup at the table. And not to mention, it was me who was sat at the table. So the reason why I said this was I wanted to clarify that there was a personal violation and people could hear that it was coming from a female voice. So now I've made a statement that there's violence and that there's a personal violation of me. So it's not just that I was, I was trying to break up a fight. You know, I was closed in on this. I was being personally vi violated. So I wanted everyone to know and I wanted, most importantly, James to know that everybody else knew. And so again, I repeated that about 10 times. Um, the two younger girls of the group were trying to hold the men back from the men who they were with and at that point james was actually standing passively leaning on my table for two reasons <laughs> one to block me in from the only exit and two to bring those people to him exactly where he was blocking me in so he had riled them up and antagonized them enough that they were actively violent. Like I said, punching walls, screaming, the women had to hold them back. And James was just ready to stand back and let it all happen. He had gotten them where and in the state that he wanted them to be. And he was just standing there actually leaning on my table like he was having a regular conversation so i got a little closer to him and i stood more squarely to him and i looked him right in the face as i was repeating um, i kept at that point i was then alternating basically all of my statements there will be no violence here step away from my belongings go down that direction go down that path leave here leave here and eventually it worked. James turned around and left. And as soon as the group of men saw that the threat was over, and you know they did have the two young women who were trying to pull them away, they they pretty easily went down the went down the other direction. As soon as James had backed away, turned around, and went the other direction, the whole situation that James had incited was over now i wasn't about to leave for any room of i excuse me i wasn't about to leave room for james to come back or for james to think that he can get away with this ever again with me that is so i pursued him on the path following be, following behind him and once again in my in that strong authoritative loud voice telling him keep going keep going don't turn around you get out of here so you know imagine this like picture this i am now pursuing him he did not turn around he was just walking at a leisurely pace or a regular pace you know not slow but just walking at a normal pace and he didn't dare turn around to even look at me let alone address me or you know try to come back and start something up again and so i had successfully switched the dynamics so he had targeted me to harm and victimize me and then i ended up pursuing him to chase him away and to put him in his place and so I followed him just for a few yards, just until he got the message and until I was sure that he wasn't turning around. And I went back to my booth just to ground myself. Nobody else was around except, I mean, there were people within earshot, but nobody was in my immediate vicinity because it's just like a, a one-way path, right? However, right across the path, over to the left a little bit, at i believe it's house number 16 if you're from the area there is a woman who had come out about halfway through all of this attack and just stood there watching silently 
like I said, sh those houses, she was protected from a, a six foot fence, but she also had um, just the way the hill is situated, she could see everything. She didn't say or do anything to try to intervene or help defuse the situation. She didn't call the police. Uh, she didn't take video evidence for the police. She didn't even try to vocalize an intervention. She just watched me, <laughs> a petite, five foot three, 115 pound female up against a pack of drunken, violent men. She didn't give a fucking shit. It was insane. So I, I walked to my booth just to have like a, a point in space where I could steady myself. So I was very conscious about um, regulating my breath, my heart rate, and even my hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. And so after a minute of just like really just a very brief moment, a few seconds of grounding and stabilizing myself, I turned to look at the woman who was still standing there. And I was a little bit shaken up so that I couldn't, I, have, I was having a, a hard time properly responding to the behavior of the bystanders. Um, not acknowledging how perverse and fucked up it was that everybody just stood around and watched like it like they were watching WWE wrestling like it was some form of entertainment and they were on the other side of a TV screen watching something that wasn't real and that didn't matter and so you know what <laughs> um, you know I'm tempted to say stupidly of myself but I'll try to be kinder <laughs> to myself um, I had said to her, thank you, <laughs> because, you know, I, I was still a little ungrounded and I was a little shaken up. You know, you got this hormones racing through you, the adrenaline and cortisol. When your life is in danger, your, your biological system will take over to put you in the fight or flight response so that you can physically get yourself out of the situation. Now, I had stayed pretty calm during it all, um, which is why I was... I was able to command that authority, but nonetheless, there's still a bit of that biological function happening in this instance. And so that was the state that I was rebounding from when I acknowledged this woman standing right next, right at her fence, overlooking everything. Now, she didn't say a damn thing. <laughs> just standing there, even after everybody else is gone and it's just me, she's just watching me. And so I was the one to initiate uh, interaction. And I said, thank you. So in my mind, I was thinking like, oh, I'm glad there's witnesses because that might help in some way. Even though they were the worst witnesses you could ask for, people who were entirely passive and permissive of abuse and did nothing and showed no inclination of concern or care, you know, in that kind of situation, I'm thinking about like five steps ahead. Like if the police are involved, there's witnesses and everything. It's not a guarantee that they're going to be good eyewitnesses. But um, so it, that was the thought in my mind. Um, thanking her for being a witness. <laughs> but she's a, she wasn't actually a real witness. And her response to me was, I couldn't do anything. And, you know, this isn't really, like, the whole situation of the perverseness of the bystanders wasn't registering with me fully yet. So I'm still, like, trying to be kind to her. And I said, you know, I think just having witnesses around helps to deter, helps to deter an assailant, even though she was actually behind James, so James didn't necessarily know she was there. As I said, James left because he didn't, because of the attention I was calling to his actions. But he didn't leave because there were witnesses. That woman was standing there for, you know, halfway through all of this. And so I guess at some point I had said to this woman, he had come and targeted me at 
at my booth. And like I said, there are specific reasons from his behavior, from a series of attacks from him over the past few weeks that I can definitively say he did indeed target me and this was strategic. And whether or not this woman can fathom the strategic nature of his attack, she gaslit me, invalidated me, and then defended James. She said, oh, no, he didn't. He, he didn't. He wasn't targeting you. Keep it in mind, she didn't see the beginning of this. So who is she to even say, if she didn't see everything that happened in this instance, who is she to say what, what did happen? Who is she to tell me my reality is false? Me, the only witness to it all, is inaccurate. And her delusional version of a reality that she wasn't present to, that's true. And so I, I started to get a little bit firmer. Um, you know, I was still calm, but I started to get a little bit firmer. And I said, he absolutely did. And I described a little bit of what he was doing um, to target me in this instance. And then she comes back with, Oh, he's just, ha he just has a lot of trauma. Hold up. What? That was the point where everything clicked in my head. I was like, wow, this woman is fucked up. Like this, this ain't a, a regular witness. This isn't a real witness. So she was actually making an excuse for and justifying James's abuse and gaslighting me. And at no point did she check on my welfare. At no point did she display concern for me. And in fact, it was when I spoke up for myself that she started to abuse me. When people gaslight you, that is abuse. When people endorse abuse upon you, that is abuse. So. I want to clarify something with this whole trope of a, somebody isn't accountable for their behavior because of trauma. This is introduced ex mostly in the New Age cult communities and psychology cult communities. And this is a PSYOP or a mind control program rather that has been cooked up and introduced into the public domain by the Illuminati but the public falls for it and starts to repeat it and so this is something that you'll hear commonly uh, commonly used from new age cultists and also people in the psychology profession who are cultists. Now let's take a brief moment to break down why this is so fucked up. So one, you are completely ignoring their chosen behavior. So pretending like it didn't happen, pretending like it wasn't a choice, pretending like it didn't come from them. Two, you are invalidating and gaslighting the victim the actual target, the person on the receiving end of the abuse, which further traumatizes and victimizes them. You are also enabling and endorsing abusive behavior in general, saying it's okay if somebody has trauma. It's okay because whoever perpetrates has trauma. It's okay because we're all traumatized. And that's the logic that a lot of people say, um, a lot of cultists say, we're all traumatized. And they say that as though that means none of us are accountable for, their beha for our behavior. And while it may be true, that actually brings us to a magnificent point. If we are all traumatized, then why do some of us not perpetrate? Why do some of us not abuse? And some of us do. That's because it is a choice. And as I said, it's an expression of evil. And so also with this excuse that, oh, he's traumatized, it, it makes it sound like because of that, he doesn't have to be held accountable for his actions. 
So you're trying to brainwash the victim of his abuse with this belief that he's not accountable for his actions and nobody who is abusive is because they've experienced trauma. So at that point when she said it, <laughs> I was just like, that was like my alarm bell. I was like, whoa, this isn't a normal interaction. This isn't anything healthy. Um, you ain't gonna get anything productive out of this exchange, walk away. So I did, I just walked away and she had nothing else to add. So I went back to my booth, I sat down, uh, worked on grounding for a minute, but then intuition told me, now I didn't see them yet, but intuition told me, and I didn't even hear anybody, <laughs> but intuition told me that there were people over at this little uh, swimming entrance at the river where the, where the ropes hang and people, you know, they just, it's a good swimming entrance into the river, right? And so it's a few yards down. And I wasn't even hearing anybody, but intuition said, there are people over there and you need to go over and see who it is. And I did. And what do you know? It's this couple from the local spiritual new age community who I had connected with before on, you know, like a mild level, a couple conversations, really just in passing, nothing too deep. And I had, but I'd even seen them earlier that day. And we stopped and said hi to each other. Now, what's interesting is that in the past few weeks, um, God had actually guided me to pray for them. And I felt like they had a lot of potential. I felt like they were light workers. And I'm learning that being a light worker doesn't actually make you a good person. It means that you have a potential for a great capacity of light but if you don't form your own character then that potential is never filled and you just go along with the evil of this world so spirit was guiding me that these were light workers they had great potential and to pray for them just for their well-being um and their success in their embodiment of their soul and that was something that was very private. It's not like I told them that, um, you know, God guided me to pray a few times for them and I did. So nonetheless, even though I believe these are people who don't have an ill will for others, they repeated the same thing as that first woman at door number 16. And they got, particularly the guy actually, got offended whenever I just laid out what happened, the reality, and I put my foot down on abuse. And you know, it didn't even dawn on me at the time that this couple would have witnessed the attack. Because as I said, I was having a hard time, uh, you know, integrating the reality that there were witnesses who stood by apathetically and, you know, what that, what that meant. But they would have actually seen when James first verbally assaulted and threatened the group of people, because it was actually a little bit down the path and it was right in front of where this couple was swimming. And they were actually, they were, they were river bathing. So it's not like they were recreationally swimming. It's not like they had gone out deep and um, they weren't witnesses. They were, they were actually using the river to bathe. So they would have heard and even seen James antagonize and verbally assault this group of people. And then they certainly heard my female voice trying to protect myself. And at no point did they leave their little post at the river. So when I walked over there, when Spirit guided me to go check to see who was at the river, I was quite surprised. And I already had positive associations of these people, which, you know, didn't help me to integrate the reality that they had, they were completely indifferent to the abuse and the violence, and that they knew a female was being put in a vulnerable position. So I started talking to them normally and explaining what happened, as though they didn't have any sense at all what might have happened. 
but I did specify that James had targeted me. And yet again, what do you know? They gaslit me. They said, no, he didn't. Really? <laughs> so you definitely saw some part of it, but you didn't see the part where I was involved. So how can you tell me I wasn't targeted? How can you definitively state the reality of something you did not bear witness to? And if you're going to claim to know the whole reality, why didn't you intervene? Why, when I approached you, did you have no alarm about what happened? Also, they did not ask me if I was okay. Once again, showed no concern for my safety or well-being. And what was interesting was the couple said that James had come into their life recently. He had approached them and said that he wanted to help them like find land for their uh, for their caravan. And they had spent uh, a couple days with him. And that each time, the more he would drink throughout the day and the more intoxicated he became, the more aggressive he was. And the woman had said, just spending time with him just in general, he was, to he was tolerable, she said. She said she didn't like being around him, but he was tolerable. So <laughs> she spent an entire day with someone who she didn't like, tolerating them for what? And then when he got aggressive throughout the day with the alcohol, and let's just pause to say intoxication, drugs, alcohol, none of it is ever an excuse for abuse or evil. She said that eventually it was hard for her to actually tell him that he needed to leave. So this indicates, you know, really poor boundaries and enabling and being permissive to abuse and evil. You know, not even discerning who you spend hours of your time with and let into your personal life. And they were the ones who told me that he actually has the nickname around town of Psycho James and that they've seen some of that psychotic behavior. Now, what it actually is, it's not, you know, if you're really talking about, about it in psychological terms, it's not psychosis, it's not psychotic, it's narcissistic and sociopathic. And so this couple also told me that James started to kind of turn on them and they were so surprised because at first he had been so nice to them, so welcoming, uh, wanting to help them so much. And I said, that's, that's very characteristic of, of a narcissist. They love bomb you, but eventually the mask will fall, especially the more boundaries you put in place. The mask will fall and you'll see their true nature. I said, there's always a turning point with narcissists, you know, when they turn on you. And the guy really did not like the fact that I was defining the reality. He said, um, I also told them that James said he is a Satanist. And he said, oh, but he's not these labels. <laughs> so it's acting as though I had imposed these stereotypes upon some innocent man that I had falsely identified him as something. You know, that's what it is when you're labeling someone. You're lumping them in with a stereotype. So that's very different from identifying reality based on facts. Not to mention, Satanist was James's own way to identify himself. That's what he said about himself. And I was just passing along the message. Um, but the man was, was very clear. Um, he was very passive aggressive. So it was clear he was angry and upset, but he was very passive in it. Because as a spiritual person, he needed to appear as a person of love and light. And of course, this is false love and light. So there's a really big issue in the spiritual community, which I want to address with you, which is that passivity is love. Hell no, it ain't. Truth is love. Honoring yourself is love. Honoring God is love. And you must know yourself in God to be able to honor both. Once again, that comes that comes in with identifying your values, really forming your values, 
what's important, what's real, and why, and so then executing or embodying those values, which forges your character. So light isn't passive. It is assertive. It must assert itself. If it is passive, it's actually subjected to the will of whatever is around it. And, you know, I'm calling this couple out because everyone needs to be responsible and accountable for their own behavior. Even though, as I said, I believe they don't have a desire to cause harm, they are causing harm. And it, that should mean something. And, you know, it's not like I ever expect them to come across this video and I'm not naming them. But if we want a better world, we all have to be responsible for ourselves. And that's what I want to call attention to today. And, you know, the fact that if it, it excuse me, if it were true that they don't have ill will and they actually do want good for the world, then they would have a real desire to reflect and really take in these concepts or these perspectives from somebody who they were involved with in order to improve themselves and improve the world. So that, like I said, you know, chances that they'll come across this video are slim, but I think it's important that we address these issues within the spiritual community. So let this story and this example be a call to you to look deeper in how you're embodying your values, if you're embodying your values, and how you can stop enabling abuse and evil and stand up against it. And, you know, another thing that the couple said that um, they'd seen James cry and he had said something about being abused by his mother and therefore they felt bad for him. Now, if you are educating yourself on narcissism, you know that everything a narcissist does is manipulative. It's for manipulative purposes. And that includes crying and revealing, um, you know, your bad circumstances. I mean, he wanted sympathy from them so that he could continue to break down their boundaries and insert himself and his delusional reality into their life or try to bring them into his delusion, which is how it goes with every narcissist. And what do you know, it worked. <laughs> so the couple said that, um, you know, they had no concern for his, his violent, abusive behavior at all. They had concern for what he went through, you know, the abuse he went through, but not the abuse he's, per he's perpetuating. And I'll say it again, abuse, is not an excuse to abuse. How many of you have been abused and you don't abuse? That's because it's a choice. And so, you know, they wouldn't listen to anything I said whenever I talked about all, all my experiences with the multiple times James had targeted and attacked me, the nature of narcissism and just anything I said, they wouldn't actually acknowledge it and engage with it. Instead, they return the conversation back to their own narrative of James is a good person. Everybody's a good person. James just been traumatized and they want to see the, they want to help him. They actually said they want to help him. And I looked at the woman and I said, can, do you actually believe that you can help somebody who doesn't want your help and doesn't even want to help themselves? And this was something hard for her to accept. It was like the only part that was acknowledged from what I said. And it was only acknowledged by her. The man was very resistant to, to everything that I was putting into the space. So it was a, was a one-sided conversation, which isn't a real conversation. They would just, you know, they weren't engaging with what I was saying, just returning the conversation back to their narrative and I recognize that, you know, if there was any potential for these people to open up to a whole new way of thinking, that um, I, it would need to be in an atmosphere of calm. So I was, you know, I was just speaking from the heart in a very calm and grounded way. And I was actually giving them the chance to speak and I was listening to them and addressing what they were saying, even though they weren't doing the same with me. 
And so, you know, the, the man wrapped it up by saying, he's a person first. He's not labels. He's a person just like you and me. Now, what's interesting about this is the man was actually labeling me as a labeler. Remember, as I said, labeling is about lumping someone in with a stereotype, and it's not based on facts and evidence. It's not based on the person themselves. And he wasn't engaging with anything I was saying. He just didn't like the words narcissist and Satanist. And so, therefore, in his mind, anybody who says those words are a labeler. So in essence, he was labeling me falsely as a labeler. He was lumping me in with this stereotype that he had built up in his own mind about people who speak on these subjects. And there's something interesting about that statement. He's a person just like you and me. Now you can look at this in two different ways. If he's a person, well, first of all, First of all, let's look at, no, he's not a person just like you and me, because we don't go around abusing people. We are not evil. We are not narcissists. We operate from the paradigm of love, not abuse, not malevolence, not ill will, not manipulation. Our souls aren't corrupted by the narcissism. But also you could flip it around and look at it from another direction. If he is a person just like us, then he should be held accountable to his behavior. What if you and I don't abuse people, why is he abusing people? If he's a person just like us, why isn't he held accountable to his behavior if we are? Do you go around victimizing and abusing people and with the excuse that you've endured trauma so it's justified? Or it, excuses the behavior? No. So, in essence, he's not a person just like you and I. And, you know, at one point I was able to have a conversation with just the woman alone when somebody else came down the path and and the guy was talking to him and she was talking about how she was starting to learn the lesson of boundaries. And she was describing some of the situations. And so it was clear that this is a new concept to her. And I really just encouraged the boundaries and helped to validate, you know, their purpose, why they're useful, how to execute them in a really just personal conversational way. And so not like an analytical way, just a, just a personal way. And I said, there's actually a theme in the conscious in the collective consciousness right now. So I'll share that with you all. And the theme is the rise of the fierce or strong feminine. And so I started to encourage that in her too. I said, you know, femininity, we are often conditioned means being passive. Um, but like what happened right there when I was attacked by James, he was standing right next to me and I had to stand up to him and channel my personal power in order to save myself. I said I was channeling the strong feminine and she was actually receptive to me um you know she was she was more receptive to me throughout the whole conversation than the man um and so when we actually parted ways uh we exchanged hugs the woman initiated hugs and she actually gave me a hug whenever I said I was um channeling fierce feminine and she was like good for you and she asked me if I wanted a hug and she offered one and it was a real hug and then when we parted ways we hugged again and she initiated it again and the man who I've received hugs from before so I know that he's a conscious hugger I know that he likes to hug you know in general and he does so deliberately it's a real embrace it's meant to be like a heart connection like all of this all of these are components of a hug for him. I already know this. But this time, his hug was completely different. It was very clear that he was withdrawing from me, um, up from this passive anger. So he, it was just like an arms hug, right? <laughs> so he actually kept his heart space way away from mine. 
and he was just going through the motions to appear to be polite, to keep up this image of light and love, even though clearly he wasn't feeling it. He wasn't feeling loving towards me. No, he was saving that love for my abuser. <laughs> and that's not real love either, but just to point out the irony for you. And, you know, as an empath, it was very clear that he, and really anybody can pick up on these things, that he was withdrawing his energy from me the whole time, not just in the hug, but the whole interaction. I would say it was the uh, nuanced skill of an empath, which allowed me to recognize that he was angry. He was angry at me, but he wasn't showing it. And so everything he was saying was um, to keep up this image of how spiritually aware he is, of how unconditionally loving he is, where it was extremely hypocritical because he wasn't loving right in the moments in the here and now with me, as I said, you know, uh, gaslighting me and defending my abuser, refusing to listen to me or engage with me just because he didn't like what I was saying even though I had valid points based on facts and reality. And so that is to say, don't let an ideal of spirituality hijack real spirituality, real light and love. Love is not an ideal. Love is actually actions. It's integrity-led actions. And there is nothing spiritual or virtuous or of integrity to allow, permit, enable, endorse, or excuse abuse. Real love stands up against acts of abuse and evil. Too often people are just trying to live up to an ideal of spirituality and love, something that's been imposed upon them. And so they're not living from the inside out, but from the outside in. Taking on these toxic and dysfunctional messages and beliefs, which are initiated by the Illuminati, they're injected into the spiritual communities. These ideas of, um, you know, excusing abuse because someone's been abused or don't have any boundaries because ultimately we're all one. Or that the feminine is soft and flowy and passive. Sometimes there's definitely one element of divine feminine which is strong and fierce and mighty. And for the past few weeks, that's really been a strong theme in the collective consciousness. If you've been noticing this in your own life, if you're a woman who is compelled to be more strong and assertive, and if you're a man who is being confronted with these new sides of femininity around you. So it's, it affects everybody, both men and women, masculine and feminine. It is the masculine's job to hold space for this fierce feminine, to support it, to, and by support it, I don't just mean um, allow for it, but to actually contribute to it, to help it, to, be stronger. We are meant to be combining our power and strength rather than being a power struggle where if a woman is strong then the man that means the man is weak. So stand up for yourself. You know this this was probably the first time that I was just routinely uh, beat down from everyone around me and I didn't back down, not only in my actions, but in the way I felt inside with relation to myself and to God. I, I actually noticed the inclination to shrink and to feel bad about myself and to second guess myself. Like, was I too strong? Was I too clear in defining the reality? But the answer was no. When I checked with myself, I was like, no, everything I did was very deliberate. Every word I said was very deliberate, aligned with personal integrity. And, you know, there was also that inclination to feel bad because I, I thought maybe I, I had ruined a potential connection, a deeper connection with, uh, with this couple. Because before this, I felt a potential for connection. 
But again, I saw that inclination and I just denied it. And I was like, no, um, I'm going to love myself regardless of how others feel about me. I did what was right and I'm proud of myself. And I even spoke the truth rather than just high, squirreling the truth away for myself. I made the truth known. That's, that's, that's required for truth, for it to be known. If you are hiding truth, then that's a secret. <laughs> that's concealment and secrecy and shadows. That's not truth. So I let it be known to the neighbors that, and to everyone around that this man had targeted me and that he was a Satanist. I know I had even said to this couple that um, I, I alluded to him being Illuminati and it, it turned out that they already knew that and they were still spending time with him and they were still defending him. Um, but when they weren't listening to anything I said, I finally put my foot down a little bit firmer and I said, I, well, I know the underground organized abuse network in the area. And I know James's involvement and there is no excuse for abuse of children. And I could physically see them like back away, like shutting down all of their defenses because they couldn't argue with that. And it, it's so interesting that, you know, so many people, they won't, they won't excuse abuse of children, just abuse of everybody else. <laughs> Nobody deserves abuse. Nobody has the right to be abusive. And so I felt their energy like shut down and they actually physically backed away a little bit. Like they were, they were defenseless to that and they, they didn't argue anymore. And instead they just changed this, they changed the subject. So they didn't, not only did they not argue, but they didn't address what I had said. Once again, it's this one-sided conversation, not actually listening or in, engaging with me. Um, so they changed the topic to something light. But at one point in our whole interaction, they did say, oh yeah, he said that I, when I said something about him being, um, declaring himself a Satanist, they said, oh yeah, he said that he had ties to the Royals. And I said, oh yeah. And he, did he tell you that his, one of his, uh, good family friends was Anton LaVey? Cause that's what he told me. And so they already knew, like nobody was saying the word Illuminati, but they knew <laughs> what it was. They were making the connections and you know, it didn't matter to them that uh, James is Illuminati. And let's put that into perspective, um, into context. When you're Illuminati, you're not just a Satanist, which is awful in itself. It is the embodiment and the worship of evil. Whether you believe in Satan or not, when you're worshiping evil, you are evil and you're putting more evil into the world by the focus of your consciousness. Also, with to be an Illuminati member, that involves pedophilia, rape, murder, torture, mind control programming. Human, and all of this is within the sphere of human trafficking. So let that hit home. When somebody is an Illuminati member, as James, personally identified himself that is what he is and what he does and nonetheless that didn't affect this couple and their perception of him or their willingness to spend time with him and be pals it's just mind-boggling how much people are just still continuing to refuse reality of our planet if you want a better world, you've got to make changes, starting with yourself. Is there anybody here who doesn't want a better world? Other than the narcissist, okay, they are happy with things go as they're going. Are there any genuine people here who doesn't want a better world? Raise your hand. Nobody? That's right. We all want a better world, so that means we've all got to do something about it. It's not going to get better by nothing or by us continuing to pander to our current dysfunctional society by enabling abuse. 
by having no personal cause for which we live, by not having values, by not trying to bring improvement and light and love into the world. So in other words, if you are not active in your role of contributing light to the world, of contributing progress to the world, then you are part of the problem. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. That is so very true. And look, everyone's on their own path. And you know, some people might be in circumstances of victimization and suffering that are just beyond their control, you know, such as victims of MK Ultra who are still enslaved to it or who are actually when you're breaking out of it is as you start to break out of it is when it grips you the most. And so your focus might be um, to heal and help yourself. And that is your contribution to the world. But don't let that, don't let your need to help yourself and to put so much focus on yourself. Don't let that shut out the possibility for bringing light to others, but also know that, you know, as taking care of yourself, self-love, that is love into the world. But once your cup is full with your own love, then it overflows. And that overflow is what you give to the world. But we, off, we overlook so many opportunities that we are, are all personally able to stand up for truth and for love, no matter your circumstances. So I'd like to ask you to take some time to consider where you can contribute light and love from more integrity, where you can contribute or how you can contribute to the improvement of our world. What are some opportunities that maybe you missed in the past to stand up for what's right? And on reflecting, upon reflecting, whoa, <laughs> I can't get the words out of my mouth and I'm not editing this video. Let me rephrase that. When you reflect on those missed opportunities, let that be an opportunity to figure out how you can do better in the future. What's a better way that you could have handled that and prepare yourself for such circumstances in the future or just recalibrate how you carry yourself through the world based on that missed opportunity, what you could have done or should have done maybe a little better. So listen, this was a longer video, so I'm not actually going to go into the details of how James targeted me and his strategy for targeting me, not only in this instance, but with previous incidents as well. And so it was all connected and tied together as it is with uh, targeted individual abuse, especially coming from somebody who is self-proclaimed Illuminati. Um, but, you know, I don't need to go into, I think it, it might be a little bit helpful for people to understand the tactics that the Illuminati use, but, um, you know, maybe in a different video. But I don't feel like I need to explain it in order to prove that he was targeting me. The point is, um, you know, and whether you can say that's just my perception or not, the point is everyone's behavior and res everyone's response to me was just not right. To gaslight me, invalidate me, and then defend my abuser, none of that is okay. Regardless of if I provide, uh, you know, a specific account or evidence of the way he targeted me. So I'll wrap it up there, everybody. Thank you for tuning in and for reconnecting with me. It's been an interesting time for me. The past couple of weeks have actually been like a little bit of a paradise inside a war. Because, <laughs> you know, there's always that spiritual warfare. But in many ways, I got a break in the past couple of weeks, and I am just trying my best to enjoy it without worrying about what's going to happen if or when it leaves. Uh, so that's what's been going on with me the past few weeks. Um, last week, there was an incident where I was kidnapped 
Um, and so I'm laughing at it because like just the, the fact that this is the nature of my reality is a bit absurd to me. You got to laugh if you want to stay sane when you're a TI, when you are just face to face with and tangoing with, tangoing with evil on a regular basis. You got to bring some lightness to it. So yeah, I was, you know, it was technically kidnapping, but again, I was guided in how to activate my personal power and get through it. And so I did. If you want to read about that, I described the situation and my police reports in a Facebook post on my no witness, no witness whistleblowing page linked in the description box below. I did file a police report and the police have yet to actually have a conversation with me, let alone investigate. So that is to say I filed the report online. I know that they received it, but they won't talk to me. So that's just a little quick update. And I look forward to connecting with you in future videos. It might be more audio videos because they're just a lot easier to make. And so it actually gives me more opportunities to connect with you when I don't have to worry about all the components of the video aspect. I don't know if you realize it takes a lot of work. You should try, I think everyone um, should make YouTube videos so that they know um, what it's like on the other side. And also, you know, give yourself an opportunity to put your voice out there. I always think it's a good idea for anybody to make YouTube videos. All right, before we get on to another subject, <laughs> I will see you in the next video. Peace and namaste.